Okay, so the next topic is going to be probably our longer topic today, um, and I think it's one that is of interest to many. And we're going to talk about intellectual property protection with a focus on technical data and computer software. So under government contracting rules, the FAR and the DFAR really break intellectual property into three main categories, patents and inventions, technical data, and computer software. Uh, the rules also address copyright protection. Uh, we're not going to really talk about copyright much today. Also, aren't going to talk too much about patents, but I am going to have just one slide on it just so we kind of distinguish in our mind what are the patent rules cover versus technical data versus computer software. So patents. The rules and government contracts governing patents are based on the Bayh-Dole Act, which is federal legislation. Uh, in terms of the FAR, the clause is 52.227-11, patent rights ownership by the contractor. This is the clause that would be in your contract if you're a domestic contractor. If you are a foreign contractor, you might have the Dash 13 clause in there, which basically has different rules about who defaults to having title in subject invention. So what does this clause say? This clause says that if you have a subject invention, the contractor has the right to retain title in the subject invention, but the government receives a broad license to practice the invention for government purposes. Well, what is a subject invention? A subject invention is an invention that is first conceived or first actually reduced to practice in the performance of a government contract. Notice there is an or there, first conceived or first actually reduced to practice. So if you conceive an idea and the government gives you funds to reduce that idea to practice, and that's the first time that you actually reduce to practice, that the working model of that invention has been created, it is a subject invention. If you conceive of the idea for an invention in performance of a government contract, but then later first actually reduce it to practice with your own private funds, it is still a subject invention. So it's an or, not an and. It's important to keep in mind that it is actual reduction of practice. Under patent law, I'm not a patent lawyer, but under patent law there's a concept of constructive reduction of practice, which is if you file a pat, provisional patent application, that is enough to constructively reduce it to practice for some patent rules. It is not enough for government contract rules. So filing a provisional patent application alone is not actual reduction of practice. Again, it's more creating some form of a working model. Uh, the government receives a non-exclusive, non-transferable, irrevocable, you can't take it away from them, paid up, they don't have to pay you, it's a free license, to practice or have practiced for or on its behalf the invention throughout the world. So it needs to be practiced for the government but a different contractor can practice that invention for the government. There are strict notice and reporting requirements to be aware of. There is a time frame in which you need to notify the government of the development of a subject invention, that it has been conceived or first actually reduced to practice. Um, there is also a time frame for when you have to elect to retain title, either in the U.S. or any other country, and a time frame in which you tell the government where you are filing patent applications. Why are there all these strict rules? Because if you as a contractor decide, you know what, there's this invention, I don't really care about it. I'm not going to patent it. I'm not going to go through all these. I'm, it's, it's just, I'm not interested. Well, the government might be interested. So if you do not notify the government and give them the ability to protect themselves, the government will not be happy. What's the result? If you do not timely notify the government of the existence of a subject invention, the government can revoke your title. They could also decide not to give you a license at all, which means you cannot practice that invention. So there, there's some strict rules. You, you know, usually for some first-time offenders, the government doesn't get that strict about it. Um, it. Best bet is if you're now going back after this and you're saying, oh, no, I have these subject inventions. I don't think we've disclosed it. Do a mea culpa. Uh, the government, once they learn that there was a subject invention that was not timely disclosed, they have 60 days to decide whether or not they want to take title. And after that 60 days, you're, you're back in the clear. So again, you're, you're going to want to probably put them on notice, look at your portfolio. Uh, also, if it is a subject invention in the patent application you file, you need to actually have some specific language that this invention was developed with government funding support. Uh, it's interesting that a lot of clients might 
put that in the patent application, but they don't make the disclosure to the government. And putting it in the patent application alone is not enough to, for this disclosure. It actually needs to be a disclosure to the contracting officer. Um, it's best to implement in your patent and invention policies and procedures. All it takes is a checkbox. Was this invention conceived or reduced to practice in the performance of a government contract, yes or no? And if the answer is yes, based on what your inventor thinks, you look into it further. Um, the, I want to also mention that the Department of Energy has some different rules when it comes to patents. They actually default for a large business to DOE owning the invention and the contractor getting a license. Um, you can get a waiver of that either on a specific basis or a class waiver basis. So it's something that you'll want to be aware of if you're contracting with DOE. Again, I'm not going to get into it into too much detail today. I think that was probably more than I planned to. Um, so the next topic then is technical data. And I'm going to talk about technical data in terms of and, and computer software, both in the context of non-commercial item contracts and goods and, serve, and products and commercial item. What is a commercial item? Well, that was last year's seminar, for those of you who didn't attend. Um, but we do have articles over there about commercial item. It's defined in FAR 2.101, so I'm not going to go into it into detail, but let us know if you're not sure. Technical data, what is that? That is recorded information of a scientific or technical nature, regardless of the form or method of recording. It includes computer software documentation, but it doesn't actually include the computer software itself. That is a separate definition. Um, and it also does not include data incidental to contract administration. So your financial administration, information management, your certified cost or pricing data, for example. That's not technical data. The general rule for technical data is you follow the funds. Who funded the development of the technical data? And that is done down to the lowest identifiable segregable level. Uh, so if you have, I, I mean, I always give the simple example, and nothing is ever that simple, is you have a drawing that is a box. So that is the box, the drawing of the box, that was funded at private expense. The government then pays you money to add a rectangle to the box. The government will get what is known as an unlimited rights license in the rectangle, but only a limited rights license in the box. So if it is funded, Exclusively at private expense, the government receives a limited rights license in the technical data. If it was funded in whole or in part at government expense, the government receives an unlimited rights license in that technical data. What is a limited rights license? It is, gives the government the right to reproduce and use the data with the express limitation that it will not be used for manufacture or disclosed outside the government without the written permission of the contractor. This means if the government only receives a limited rights license, they may not give it to your competitors to manufacture the product for the government. An unlimited rights license, on the other hand, gives the government the right to use, disclose, reproduce, prepare derivative works, distribute copies to the public, perform publicly, display publicly in any manner, for any purpose, and to have and permit others to do so. They can give that data to the public for any reason, including a commercial purpose. They could give it in response to a Freedom of Information Act request. So it's, it's out there. Uh, the government only gets rights, though, in what is actually delivered to the government. Although they have theoretical rights in, in any technical data that they fund the development of, in practicality, they only get rights in what is delivered. So that tells you that you really need to be careful about looking at your contracts and identifying what are the technical data deliverables that we are going to be required to provide to the government. So in addition to that data that was developed in whole or in part at government expense, the government gets unlimited rights in other categories of technical data as well. Manuals or instructional and training material that you need for installation, operation, or routine maintenance and repair for goods that are delivered under the contract. So if you need to give the government certain manuals, again, they could put that up on, their, on a website. Form, fit, and function data. We'll be talking about form, fit, and function data a lot today. It's defined in the FAR as data relating to items, components, or processes that are sufficient to enable physical and functional interchangeability. It talks it's about source, size, configuration. I mean, it's basically, you know, if you go back to my example of the box, right, and the rectangle, 
and maybe the rectangle is really what you use to connect it to other products. Um, but inside that box, there's an intricate computer working system with a bunch of uh, components and parts. Maybe the government gets the drawing of the box and the rectangle, but they don't get the drawing of everything that's inside the box. So the form, fit, and function data would be they get an unlimited rights license in that regardless of how it was funded. Even if it was developed exclusively at private expense, they still get an unlimited rights license in that form, fit, and function data. Also, if you delivered data to the government and you do not market, and you do not market in accordance with the exact legend that is prescribed by the FAR or DFAR, then the government gets an unlimited rights license in it. So going back to unlimited rights license produced to your competitors in response to the Freedom of Information Act because one of your employees forgot to market. I think everyone's a little concerned right now. Uh, Department of Defense has their own rules in that they have another category of rights. It's government purpose rights. So if there is mixed funding, so it's funded both at government and private expense, mixed funding, then the government gets government purpose rights in that technical data, which means that for a specific period of time, uh, usually five years, but it's negotiable, the government can use that data for government purposes only, including for manufacture. After that period expires, the government then receives an unlimited rights license in that technical data. Well, how does this help the contractors? It helps you because for that five-year period or however long it is, you get to commercialize the technology. So for commercial purposes, you get to use it uh, the government may not disclose it to competitors or third parties for commercial purposes. I have listed here the technical data FAR and DFAR clauses that you are likely to see in your contract. Commercial items. If you are selling the government a commercial item, and it, let me distinguish too, you may have a commercial item contract that requires you to develop some new technical data for the government, just because it's related to a commercial item doesn't mean that the commercial item rules apply. You may have both the commercial item and non-commercial item technical data clauses in your contract where the non-commercial item ones would apply to any data and development that's funded by the government, and the commercial item ones apply to any pre-existing data that applies to a commercial item. So under the, there's no FAR clause uh, for commercial item technical data. In FAR 12.211, it provides that the government shall acquire only the technical data and rights in that data customarily provided to the public with a specific commercial item or process. So when you go to the store and you go buy, uh, uh, I don't know, hammer from Home Depot or, or something that has an instruction manual in it, that is the type of information that you provide to the public with a commercial item you would provide that same information to the government. And whatever license the public has with respect to that manual, it's the same license that the government would get. Under the DFAR, there is a technical data clause for commercial items, and it says that the government receives unrestricted rights for itself and others in form, fit, and function data, no different than what the FAR said, uh, correction or changes to technical data that's furnished by the government, information, again, that's necessary for maintenance, installation, operation, repair, um, or that's been provided to the government without restriction under a prior contract. This is where consistency is important. If you've already given the government unlimited rights and data, you can't then come back on your next contract and say, government, you only get limited rights or you get my commercial license. They already have it. And when you give the government rights under a Department of Defense contract for one specific agency, maybe it's Defense Logistics Agency, guess what? All of the government has a license right. This is where government likes to be big government with a big G. Um, a license to the government under one contract gives the entire government the license rights. Now, it's good for us. The government is not very organized. They don't quite have a repository of these are the technical data that we have. These kinds of rights in, these kind of rights in, and they don't share it across the board. They're, they're very disorganized. But when it comes up is when all of a sudden you see a solicitation issued on FedBizOps, and there's your drawing on FedBizOps for somebody else to manufacture. And that's when typically the disputes arise where you say, wait a second, government, you didn't have the right to disclose that. That's ours, it's proprietary, but by the way, it's already out there. That's also assuming that you know because it's on Fed, FedBizOps. What if you don't? What if you have a spare part that they gave your drawings to another manufacturer to, do, to manufacture? Well, now you have competition. The government likes competition, but you don't think the government had the right to do that 
and you see that they're doing that, that's when um, these issues come to light. Um, when you have technical data that you're delivering pursuant pertaining to a commercial item, the government may not use that to manufacture additional quantities of the commercial item, and they may not release it outside of the government without the contractor's consent. Very similar to the limited rights license, uh, but again, under the FAR, you can give the government your standard commercial license. So then we move on to computer software for non-commercial items. Uh, same standard as with technical data. It's a follow the funds test. Who developed the software? Uh, computer software is defined as computer programs, source code, object code, design details, anything that would enable the software to be reproduced, recreated, or recompiled. It does not include computer databases or computer software documentation. Again, we are trying to distinguish what falls within technical data versus computer software. Importantly, as we're talking about these concepts, the big thing it's missing is hardware. So people get very nervous because they say, well, I'm delivering this to the government and I'm delivering them my engine and they're going to get all these technical data rights. Well, wait a second. If you're just giving them your engine, there is no technical data. It's not. It's recorded information of a scientific or technical nature. Now, if there's software embedded in that, maybe on a computer chip, then that is something that the gov is being delivered to the government if it's somehow in a readable format. But um, it doesn't deal with hard hardware. We're only dealing with IP rights and technical data and computer software here. So for software you develop, uh, again, you identify down to the lowest practicable segregable level. Um, the government gets restricted rights in computer software developed exclusively at private expense. It's basically the um, synonymous with the limited rights, but they want to make things difficult and call it restricted rights when it comes to computer software. Um, and they get unlimited rights in computer software developed in whole or in part with government funds, and unlimited rights has the same definition as um, I described previously. With restricted rights relating to software, it basically can't be used, reproduced, or disclosed by the government, except basically, they have a lot of restrictions on it. It can be used for the computer for which it was delivered, or computers, if it was if it's the license said that you can use it on more than one computer. Um, they could use it or copy it for a backup computer. Um, if they transfer computers, maybe that computer broke, they move it to another computer, that's okay. Um, it, if you need to modify or adapt or combine it uh, with other software, you could, the government can do that. They could also reproduce it for safety purposes. Maybe they want to put it in a safe in case there's a fire for archive destruction purposes or other backup. Um, it also says though they can disclose that computer software to support contractors. So there's also the government purpose rights provision for Department of Defense contracts, similar to technical data. The government can use it for government purposes for a certain period of time, and then the government gets an unlimited rights license in it. These are the clauses that we see. Um, notice it's the same clause under the FAR. The data and computer software are handled in the same clause in the FAR. And there's a separate clause, however, in the DFAR for both technical data and computer software. Commercial computer software. This is different than the, the technical data definition because it is not just software that pertains to a commercial item. It's a different definition than that. It is in the FAR defined as any computer software that is a commercial item. So pretty much anything I would think that Microsoft is selling commercially um, that's going to be sold to the government that's clearly a commercial item. The government receives, uh, in terms of what do they get in commercial computer software under the FAR, they get the license customarily provided to the public to the extent such license is consistent with federal law. And that, um, that last piece of it has been subject of a lot of recent regulations because there's a lot of provisions in your typical software wrap agreement. You know, whenever you log in, I accept this software. Of course, us lawyers over, always read all that fine print. No, we don't. We don't. Um, but in terms of what it is you're accepting and signing up to when you accept that license. But there's a lot of provisions in there the government is not allowed to accept. So one of the things is indemnification. The government cannot obligate itself to indemnify you. That is a violation of the Anti-Deficiency Act because if they do not have appropriated funds for that indemnification, they are not able to commit themselves in that way. Um, I know a lot of times you have a choice of law, a choice of forum. You say if there's any disputes between us, we want to be in state court at, for this state, and this state law governs. 
Government is not subject to jurisdiction in those state courts, only federal courts. The government is not governed by state law, they're only governed by federal law. So it is best to have a different version of your computer software license, that's your standard commercial computer software license, adaptable for the government. And, and I could go on, assignment, for example. Um, you cannot assign a government contract without government consent pursuant to the Anti-Assignment Act. So when you have the provision, oh, we can freely assign this whenever we want, nope, you can't. So rather than have the government come back in and tell you uh, that we reject your license or have certain kind of gap fillers come into play based on federal law, it's best either to create an addendum, which we've done for clients, or just a whole other version that applies to the government. Under the DFAR, there's a different definition for commercial computer software, and it's software which is developed or regularly used for non-governmental purposes, which has been sold, leased, or licensed to the public, has been offered for sale, leased, or licensed to the public, or has not been offered, sold, leased, or licensed to the public, but will be available for commercial sale, leased, or licensed in time to satisfy the delivery requirements of the contract, or satisfies one of those criterion, but would require only minor modification to meet the requirements of the contract. This is also an area where, it, if you look at that definition of commercial computer software, it does not look at who funded the development of it. If the government funds the development of that commercial computer software, and then you sell it commercially, hmm, it is regularly used for non-governmental purposes, it's been sold, leased, or licensed to the public, Look, you fall within the definition of commercial computer software. And guess what? You can then charge the government your standard commercial price. So this is one of the areas where there's a lot of confusion. You'll get a, the government scratches their head about that. They sit there and say, oh my gosh, what are they talking about? We funded the development. How are we paying for this? It is permissible. It becomes commercial computer software at that point. If software meets the definition of commercial computer software, again, there's no DFAR clause. Uh, that applies, and instead it's the st contractor's standard commercial license. I've recently been seeing some contracts where it says that if your standard commercial license is not expressly incorporated in the contract as an addendum, then it, defers back, it defaults back to FAR 52.227-14 under some non-DOD contracts. So it's very important that when you submit your proposal, you include your standard commercial software license so they know what it is and that it's also then an addendum to the contract. Don't miss that key point, otherwise um, it might not be held to apply, especially if you read the fine print and you see a clause like that, which I've been seeing lately. So the FAR and DFAR uh, have a data rights assertion table. So how do you communicate to the government? Government, I see what deliverables you want in the solicitation, but I'm gonna tell you that you're going to get limited rights or restricted rights or government purpose rights in some technical data and software and unlimited rights in others. You communicate it through the data rights assertion table. This is your way to put the government on notice of what they will and will not get rights in. I have here the chart that comes from there. Interestingly, in the asserted rights category, um, those are the bases we talked about, government purpose rights, there's a CIBR data rights provision, limited rights, restricted rights. There's also potential for specifically negotiated license rights. What, when the government has this in the DFAR, commercial item is not listed there, but it really creates difficulties for clients when they're trying to fill this out and some of the technical data or software they're providing qualifies under the commercial rules. So we do recommend that you include it in the asserted restricted rights category to put the government on notice. Um, in the first column, that's where you describe the technical data and computer software. I think it's an art more so than a science in terms of how you describe it. You could identify specific drawing numbers if you have it to that level of detail or certain parts of drawings. Um, it, it, you could have a drawing and then, you know, again, certain parts of the drawing might be subject to unlimited rights, some more subject to limited rights. If you color code it and say, you know, the pink stuff, government you get rights in, yellow stuff not, however it is you want to do it. If you want to describe it more generally, um, technical data relating to this process, the more general you get, though, the more pushback you're likely to see from the government. In terms of basis for assertion, it's either developed exclusively at private expense, developed either whole or in part at government expense. So if it's going to be developed with mixed funding, that's where you have the uh, government purpose rights coming into play. And then you have the name of person asserting restrictions, which is either the corporation or the individual. You need to make sure that as a prime contractor, you are getting these from your subcontractors. 
because if you do not, the government is going to assume that they are going to get unlimited rights license in technical data and computer software that you provide to them, whether it is from you or your subcontractors. If you are a subcontractor who has to give data rights deliverables, offer this to the prime. You don't want to miss your window there. So if you have a teaming agreement, if you're submitting a proposal that you know is going to get rolled up into the prime proposal, make sure you at least put the prime on notice that you're going to have your own assertion. Um, I have on this next slide, when you're talking about commercial items, as I noticed there's that asterisk, here is kind of what you would want to put at the bottom of the chart. I'm really giving away free legal advice here, folks. Um, where you're basically saying, well, you're not required under the clause to disclose technical data and computer software relating to commercial items or processes. You are putting it out there to put them on notice um, that they will only get those rights that you give to the general public under your standard commercial licenses. Now we get to the marking requirements. As I mentioned, if you do not properly mark your technical data and computer software with the exact marking required by the FAR or the DFAR, the government will receive an unlimited rights license. Um, if you are now sitting here saying, oh no, we have not been marking, and marking confidential proprietary, that's not this marking. That is a non-conforming marking. It doesn't count. If you go back, you could, if you realize you delivered something to the government that didn't have the marking, um, you can go back to the government and request to pull back that technical data, properly mark it within six months of your delivery to the government of that technical data or computer software uh, or whatever extension the government grants you out of the goodness of their heart. If um, the government has the right to challenge the legend for a variety of ways, first of all, as I mentioned, non-conforming. So, they don't want to see confidential proprietary. The only thing you can include on there, if the government has an unlimited rights license, is you can include a copyright legend. That's permissible. And that somewhat serves to put third parties on notice of your rights in, in that drawing. Um, I know some contractors have two versions of the drawing, one that goes to the government and one that might go to the prime contractor, for example. Um, the prime contractor one does have all of those non-conforming markings to put the prime on notice of their restrictions on their ability to use the drawing, but the government doesn't want to see those markings. Um, in terms of uh, if there is a non-conforming marking, you'll see the government return the technical data or computer software to you. They'll give you 60 days to correct or strike it, or um, they do have the choice to ignore it if you decide not to take action, or they can go ahead and correct it or strike it themselves and charge you the money for it. Unjustified marking, so this is where if the government doesn't think you uh, should have a limited rights license or that, that they should have limited rights, they think they have unlimited rights, they can then challenge those markings. They could challenge these asserted restrictions and they're supposed to do it before they accept the technical data. So the government should be looking at this and monitoring it as they receive the technical data, but in any event, it must be challenged within three years after final payment or three years after delivery of the data, whichever is later. Well, we just talked about how final payment doesn't occur in cost reimbursement contracts until your final and direct rates are approved, which is now maybe 10 years down the road. So for some of these significant large development contracts that were done on a cost reimbursement basis, this is a bit of a problem. Um, and the government's not supposed to issue a challenge notice unless there's reasonable grounds to question the validity of the assertion. Not clear what reasonable grounds they really need to raise, um, but what they'll do is they'll send you a notice challenging it, and then you have an opportunity to respond, and there's uh, the FAR and DFAR layout a process for that. Beware of deferred ordering and delivery clauses. As I mentioned, the government only gets rights in what's actually delivered to them. So you now worked out your contract, you negotiated heavily on what the data and software deliverables are, and you're comfortable with the rights the government's going to get in those. But you didn't realize that one of these deferred ordering or data uh, delivery clauses are in there, and especially um, the additional data requirements clause under the FAR and the deferred ordering under the DFAR are particularly troublesome. These give the government the right to order any technical data or computer software that was not specified as a deliverable if it was first produced or specifically used in the performance of a contract under the FAR or under the DFAR if it was generated in the performance of a contract. So a little bit of a different standard under both. But they can order it for up to three years after acceptance of all items or termination of the contract, 
um, and in terms of um, subcontractors, this applies to you as well, and they run that time um, from the time the prime accepts the last item from the subcontractor. When they order this, guess what you get paid? You get paid the cost to reproduce it. In this day and age, maybe it's emailed, maybe you photocopy the drawings, you transmit the software, that's really not much. It's cents on the dollar. Um, they are not paying you for your underlying intellectual property that is in that technical data and computer software. So beware of these clauses. The FAR clause is only supposed to be included in contracts that involve experimental, developmental research or demonstration work unless all the requirements for data are believed to be known at the time of contracting and are specified in the contract. So if you see it in your contract, you might be able to go to that and say, look, government, you know what you want. It is clearly defined. It doesn't apply here. Um, but it also says they can include it in other contracts when considered appropriate, which gives the contract officers a lot of leeway to include it. For the uh, DFAR clauses, the deferred ordering clause is, can be included when there, a firm requirement for a particular data item has not been established prior to award, but there's a potential need for the data. Again, it, it seems very broad as to when the government can include these clauses. Um, and not only do they not compensate you for that data, but there's also the record keeping requirement that you need to keep this data so in case the government requests it, and again, you don't know what it is, but if there's something related to the contract that you might have developed or used that the government might possibly want, three years after final payment, you need to be able to give it to the government. Well, why do we like commercial item contracts? Well, we talked about the challenges, right? And when the government comes in and challenges whether or not they have unlimited rights or limited rights in technical data or computer software, you're looking at who funded the development. And once the government raises the challenge, the onus for non-commercial item, technical data and software, is on the contractor to demonstrate it was developed exclusively at private expense. So you need to find those uh, engineer timesheets and match it up to the time the drawings were developed and show that there was no government funding involved the onus is on you as a contractor. And most, most contractors have a very difficult time improving that up. For a commercial item contract and commercial item technical data and computer software, there is a presumption that the item was developed exclusively at private expense. So the burden of proof goes back to the government to show that it was not developed at private expense, that the government funded the development of that. So that puts the onus on the government to use their records to prove that. Um, this presumption, reverse and presumption, I guess, does not apply to Def Department of Defense acquisitions of major systems. Now we'll talk about a change in that. It's now major weapon systems. Um, and, but it does apply to major systems or subsystems or components that are COTS items. So there's an exception to the exception to the exception. It all gets very confusing. Um, but COTS items uh, still have that presumption. When I say COTS, commercially available, off-the-shelf item. There's also relaxed marking requirements. If you don't have the restricted rights and limited rights legends, there's actually no legend. The FAR and DFAR do not prescribe what legend to include on technical data or uh, commercial computer software or technical data for commercial items. So you don't have to have those two sets of drawings that you're maintaining. You can have one set that you use for both the government and commercial purposes. And again, you have the ability to negotiate those standard commercial licenses, which probably have a lot more clarity to them than the vague uh, restricted rights, limited rights licenses that are in the FAR. When you are uh, working with a subcontractor, from the prime contractor's perspective, you want to flow down these clauses. Make sure you flow down the deferred delivery and deferred ordering clauses because, and, and I hate to say this because that's when I represent the subcontractor, I push back on them every time. But, you, you know, if, if you, it actually doesn't say it. It's not a required flow down in the clause itself necessarily. It doesn't say you must include this. But the data and the software it captures would capture data and software of your suppliers. And then if you look at the prescription for when it's included in clauses, it does mention subcontractors as well. Um, the contractor needs also, the prime needs to request data rights assertion tables from the subcontractor to roll it up in what they are submitting. Um, also, from a prime's perspective, you want to again make sure the contract's identifying the deliverables. You want to make sure when you're delivering technical data and software, it's properly marked. Um, not only is that the data rights assertion table in your proposal, but you want to make sure it's also in your contract. Because if in the proposal you told the government they get limited rights in this drawing, if then in the contract 
the data rights assertions table said they're going to get limited rights. You marked it with limited rights. And now four years down the road, the government's saying, hey, we get unlimited rights in this because we all of a sudden want manufacturer B over here to make it for us. It's going to be a little bit harder for the government to make that argument. Um, from a subcontractor's perspective, this is critical. The rights in IP flow directly from the subcontractor to the government, and they pass every contractor in between. So you might have a large prime say to you as a subcontractor, we are giving you money for this, so we are going to own the IP that's developed. That is wrong. It is not their money. It is the government's money. So the only party that gets rights is the government. Now, can you give your customer rights? Of course you can. You always have that right. But it is not under the FAR DFAR requirement. Now, for in a practical standpoint, they might need to have certain license rights to use the data or computer software to fulfill their contractual requirements to the government. I mean, you can't just say, I'm going to send my portion of the software to the government directly, and the software that you're doing, customer, you send it to the government, and the government figure that, that's not going to work. Um, but the key is, is you don't want your customer to be able to use that to manufacture the product or reproduce it and cut you out. Um, the FAR is also clear that, especially when it comes to inventions, a prime contractor or higher tier contractor may not use their power to award subcontracts as economic leverage to obtain rights and technical data uh, for, or inventions from a subcontractor. So that tells you right there, not only is it not required by the FAR or DFAR, a prime is not able to use their leverage and say, we are not going to issue this contract unless you give us all the rights and the IP developed under it. Because again, it's not their money. It's government money. So now that's the basics. And some of you in this room say, oh my gosh, I already know all that. I think it always helps to hear it. And I think in order for others who are not so familiar with it, we need the baseline to go through all the recent developments. And this is a little bit of old news because I talked about it last year too, but it's, it's important. Uh, Department of Defense issued Bu Better Buying Power 3.0 in April of 2015. And this Better Buying Power 3.0 had a big focus on intellectual property. In particular, the government, the DOD said, our technological superiority is at risk. Um, and it's based on the effectiveness of our research and development efforts. And we need to make sure that commercial companies are invested in helping the government to do this research and development. And they recognize that there's barriers. Everything that we just talked about is creating a barrier for commercial companies to want to do business with the government in a research and developmental fashion. Um, so they, they have a focus on how do we do this? How do we get contractors to want to do uh, research and development with us, especially to leverage the commercial technology that's out there? So they say that we need to eliminate the barriers to using commercial technology and products, whatever barriers we have in the government, we need to make it easier. At the same time, they're making it harder to buy commercial items, though, so they're very contradictory. Um, they're assessing policy and regulatory changes, and they need to train the workforce on how to access those, access those commercial technologies and products. Um, so there's a better buying power 4.0 on the horizon that's probably going to focus on sustainment efforts. But in response to better buying power 3.0, this is what we're seeing. Uh, D Department of Defense is issuing solicitations that kind of have two tracks, where they say, give us the price for your technical data package with whatever restrictions you're putting on it, and give us another price for that technical data package where we get unlimited rights license to use it. What Better Buying Power 3.0 said to the government is you need to assess, do you, and, and there was a big um, guide DOD put out as well, are you going to pay now or are you going to pay later? So right now you can pay to get that technical data package and you can ensure you have competition in the marketplace for sustainment efforts and when you need spare parts. Or you can pay later because you're going to pay in sole source procurement, right? If you only have one source who can manufacture something because they're the only ones who have the IP rights, then the government is beholden to them and has to pay whatever it is they're going to charge for it. So each time the government's doing a procurement, they need to assess what data rights do we need and what do we include in the solicitation and what are we willing to pay to get those data rights. Also see it using as an evaluation preference. The government's going to require that you give them at least government purpose rights potentially. And if you're going to give them something less than government purpose rights, you're going to get evaluated negatively or, or get a knock down a peg in their evaluation of your proposal. We are also seeing them actively challenge data rights assertions in fairly old contracts, sometimes going back 10 years, where they're saying, you know what, we now for sustainment efforts want to have somebody else build 
uh, some of these spare parts. So we're going to look at your technical data package. And, you know, we think we had unlimited rights in the whole thing. So you prove that we don't. Or they're now looking and seeing that there were non-conforming markings. Well, non-conforming markings, um, you know, some of these challenges, are they old? Uh, can the government still come back? They were supposed to assess non-conforming markings when they were accepting delivery of these products, right? Then they're also now coming back and making, I found, a new argument, which is not necessarily challenging the markings, but they're saying, well, we actually have an unlimited rights license in this drawing already because it's form, fit, and function data. So how many contractors in this room, when they are developing a technical data package, have a separate technical data package that's just the form, fit, and function data that the government gets unlimited rights in? I don't see any hands for those on the phone. Um, you know, it, it, it is a good practice because, again, the government gets unlimited rights data in that, and I don't think traditionally contractors have been focused on that point and been focused on what is form, fit, and function data. But if you have two sets of drawings, government, here's your form, fun, fit, and function set, and we acknowledge government, you get unlimited rights in this set, but this is a full set, and we have our proper limited rights, restricted rights, whatever it is, legends on here. I think that um, it's a lot of time and expense up front, but it's going to help with the headache later on because to then come back to the government and argue which parts of those drawings are form, fit, and function versus which is something more, it's a tough argument to make, and there's not very good definition in the FAR and the DFAR for that. Um, document retention, again, is key. Um, and there's also, even if the government comes back and saying your drawings are non-conforming, if there's a lot of them, if they're outdated, if, you're, if it's maybe under some other old drawing program that you used and not the most recent one, it could be very costly to change out those markings as well. Uh, there's also uh, been uh, some final DFAR rules. Again, the final rules are already in effect and they already apply versus some proposed rules we'll talk about which we hope never become final rules. Uh, the first final rule is the presumption, um, as we talked about, is that for a commercial item, for technical data, it's a presumption that the commercial item was developed entirely at private expense and the technical data attendant to it um, was developed at private expense. The, I mentioned a major systems rule that reversed that presumption except for a cost item. The final rule, which was issued in September 2016, implemented Section 813 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2016, and it limited that to major weapon system. A weapon system is defined in the DFAR as uh, something that's acquired pursuant to a major defense acquisition program. So where I say the major weapon system is not defined, it wasn't defined in the rule, but it is in the DFAR. Um, the cost exemption was also expanded. Um, it was expanded to include a commercial subsystem or component of a major weapon, weapon system if the major weapon system was acquired as a commercial item um, or if the component of the subsystem, if the subsystem was acquired as a commercial item. And then they have some other um, exceptions here. So COTS is traditionally just commercially available off the shelf. It is the exact same form you sell it commercially with no modifications for the government. Very strict. And this opens it up to some forms of commercial items as well to, again, regain that presumption. So this was a good move for contractors. It helps in terms of expanding that presumption. It limits the exceptions to the presumption and um, expands the exception to the exception, as confusing as that gets. Uh, there's a proposed DFAR rule looking at the um, probably response to better barring power 3.0 and the need to encourage commercial advancement, technology, government working with industry together on research and development, um, that for annual independent research development, IRND costs to be allowable, under a cost reimbursement contract, um, you need to now communicate with the Department of Defense about what those IRD efforts will be. And you actually need to communicate it through an online tool, which is the Defense Technical Information Center. You need to share the results of the, def the, the investment with appropriate Department of Defense personnel at least annually and when the project is completed. Uh, you need to give copies of any inputs and updates to the ACO and DCAA to support the allowability of those costs. Major contractors also must engage in a technical interchange with a technical or operational DOD government employee before IRD costs are generated, before they are generated. 
um, and use the online input form to document that the technical interchange occurred. A major contractor is defined in the DFAR as one whose covered segments allocated more than $11 million in IR&D or bid and proposal costs to covered contracts during the preceding fiscal year. So what does this all mean? This means that you now, in order to have these costs be allowable, you need to communicate with the government about what those research and development efforts are. Well, we talked about government is subject to FOIA, right? Freedom of Information Act. What about everything going in the Defense Technical Information Center that you have to input? How is that going to be protected? Um, it's, it's very unclear. It doesn't have any protocols in place to make sure this DOD personnel is protecting this information. Um, the fact that this is now a question of allowability of cost, whether or not you shared it with the government in advance, again, this brings into the question of the DCA auditors. Are they, do they really in a position to know the research and development you did versus how you communicate it to the DOD? Is it the same? Was it sufficient? Um, and uh, it doesn't talk about what happens if there was a government breach of confidentiality of contractor information. So that's a proposed rule, not yet in effect yet. Uh, another proposed rule, uh, this is a very important one. It implements Section 815 of the National Defense Authorization Act for fiscal year 2012. And this is just proposed rule issued in June of 2016. So you can see how long it takes for the government to kind of get it around to implement regulations. Um, it permits the Department of Defense to share outside of the DOD any technical data that is necessary for the segregation of an item or process from or the reintegration of that item or process with other items or processes. So this is known as kind of the segregation and reintegration rule. It does not define anywhere what segregation and reintegration is. Um, basically, what they, they they talk about segregation or reintegration data, but they don't define segregation or reintegration themselves. It's technical data or computer software. It's more detailed than form fit or function data. Does that help? It's necessary for the segregation of an item or process or the reintegration of that item or process with other items or processes. Uh, it, is going to be a subject to the test of people reasonably skilled in the art to perform such reintegration or segregation activities. I'd say that rules out DCIA folks right there. Um, and it's also done at the lowest practical segregable level. So this is a whole other category of data that the government can disclose publicly. However, or outside the government, not publicly, outside the government. This is data though that you can mark with limited rights, restricted rights marking. So it's not unlimited rights data. This is restricted rights, limited rights data that the government can give to third parties for the purpose of segregation or reintegration. Um, and it, it says it may include, but would not typically require, detailed manufacturing or process data or computer software source code. But it could, detailed manufacturing data. It could require that. So this is limited rights, restricted rights data that's more detailed than form fit or function data. So what does this mean? It is clear as mud. If this is going to go into effect, again, what I recommend, just like what we mentioned the form fit or function data, create a set of segregation or reintegration data. This is our segregation or reintegration data government that you can give to other contractors. Put it up front rather than requiring the government to look at your drawings and parse out what they think it is present it to the government and keep it in a separate package. Uh, this data can be marked with the restricted rights, limited rights markings because that's, you know, if, if it applies. Um, and when it's given to another contractor, it can only be used for the purposes of segregation or reintegration. Uh, the owner must be notified. So you as a contractor, they need to tell you that they're releasing it and uh, whoever receives it must later destroy the data. But I always have heartburn with this because how do you unknow something? How do you then say to your competitor, I know you use it for this purpose, but pretend you never saw how we were manufacturing that product. Don't use that in your processes. Don't implement anything. It's very hard to unknow what you already know. And it doesn't specify in the rule what protections are provided to the contractor if that third party improperly uses their IP. It gets even better what this proposed rule does. It expands the government's deferred ordering rights. So before we talked about how it, for the DFAR, it is data and computer software that was generated in the performance of the contract. That is what the government can order. 
Now it would be, if, if this gets passed, generated or utilized in contract performance. Utilized. So they, if you utilized it in your contract performance, they could order it under the deferred ordering clause, regardless of whether that's your crown jewel of IP. Um, and, and they have to kind of meet some characteristics in order to um, satisfy these standards. It needs to be important for sustainment or other life cycle activity. I think that's a fairly low standard because I think the government can make the argument a lot of things are important for that. Um, there's also, uh, when you get compensated, it's only for the cost, again, of converting that data into the form that the government needs. So it also changes the time limit. We talked about there's a three-year time limit. They're going to take away that time limit. So now, indefinitely, the government can come back under this deferred ordering clause, order anything that you utilize in the performance of the contract, and require you to deliver it to the government. Think about that record-keeping requir requirement and how difficult it is to comply with that. So this is going to increase cost to comply. You need to think about if this clause gets enacted and, and this applies to you and it's in your contract, how much more do I need to increase my price to account for all the contingent computer software and technical data I may need to deliver to the government indefinitely. That's really what it comes down to. So hopefully there's some significant changes in this. Um, uh, also the rule extends the term for the government to challenge your data rights assertions from three to six years. Like I said, it's getting better. Uh, and if there's a fraudulently asserted restriction, there's no time limit. So in sum, we have seen the Department of Defense in particular has an increased focus on its technical data and computer software rights. I have to admit, for a long time now, contractors have gotten away with, sure, government, I have my key technology and you can give me millions of dollars to fund the development of this part of it, but because you don't have any rights in the base technology, you still have to come back to me for the next 30 years for the manufacture of this part. It's been great. Uh, the government's realized it's not worked out too well for them, and they created this structure, right? They're the ones who issue the regulations, and it's not working in their favor because they were paying a lot of money in sustainment costs and in uh, spare parts. So they have a renewed focus on this, and it's now time for everyone to get their IP houses in order, make sure that your, your team is schooled in the art of properly marking things, and um, making sure your data rights assertions tables are proper, that you have your segregated form fit or function data at the ready to separately send to the government, and clearly communicating with the government's key. We heard Jennifer talk about False Claims Act liability, and that the IP area is not immune from that, especially in light of what we're seeing in Escobar. You don't want to have an applied certification claim because you are delivering the government technical data with limited rights markings that you know they uh, funded the development of, right? We can have some issues there. So if you clearly communicate it to the government in your proposal, they're going to get limited rights. It's in the contract. I think it's hard for them to say they didn't know about it and weren't put on notice of what, at least how you interpreted the funding obligation. So before we get to the questions and answers, I have one more code for those on the phone. Uh, this next code is U, 2, O as an orange, 7, K. That's U as an up, 2, O as an orange, 7, K as in kangaroo. Okay, so now we can go to questions. You all want to eat, don't you? So the question is, if a contractor survives a data rights challenge, is there a precedential effect to that? Do you mean with respect to the specific data that was challenged? I, I would think the government, again, because it's government, Big G, would have a hard time if they came, if you succeeded in proving it was developed at private expenses, the government would come back to you and, and go down that path again. The question was if there's another matter, a different contracting officer, they had no idea. I would share with them the results of that investigation and say, look, we can go down this path, but I would think that whatever information you had had put together that convinced the one contracting officer would be at the ready to convince the other. So I don't, I don't think there's, unless there was a final decision that was issued or some sort of appeal or something. Um, The question is, can you have the contract and note that there was a data rights challenge and it survived the challenge? 
if the contract is ongoing, which it not always is, you can ask if the contract can be modified to reflect some sort of settlement or agreement. Um, again, it depends on how far along you got in the process. I don't know if, if that is necessarily going to be binding on a different contracting officer, but um, it, just like a commercial item determination in one case isn't necessarily binding in another case, but you would like to use it for precedential effect, I, I consider those similar. There is not a lot of case law on technical data rights and patent rights and everything in the government contracts area, more so I think in the patent area than there is in the technical data and computer software. Um, and I think we're likely to see more of it, would be my guess, given the DOD's enhanced focus on it right now. Sure. The question is, if you have technical data or computer software developed with IR&D funding, what is the data rights assertion for that? Is it private expense or others? And it's funny because I, I was hoping you'd ask that. I almost like we planted that question. Um, the answer is it's developed at private expense. So it's not mixed funding. If it is done through your indirect pool, through IR&D, even though some of that is government funds, right, especially let's say 50% of your work is government contracts, maybe 50% of that IR&D pool is technically funded by the government, it's still considered developed exclusively at private expense. Yes, in the back. The question is, do these rules apply to grants like SCIR? There are different rules when it comes to especially CIBR grants, um, cooperative agreements, Department of Energy has their own rules, so it is harder on a broad scale to talk about them. They're generally fairly similar, but like I said, DOE, when it comes to patents, they're very different. So you really have to carefully review each contract. But there are specific CIBR, in particular, data rights clauses that apply. Anyone on the computer? Okay, so the question is, what happens, basically, the interplay of the FAR and the DFAR clauses if there's government purpose rights? And the answer is, you shouldn't have both clauses in your contract. If you have a Department of Defense contract, you should only have the DFAR, technical data computer software clauses, and if it's not DOD, then you would most likely have the FAR version in it. And there's also some other agency supplementals that you might see. Um, that doesn't say the government always does it right, but typically if I'm reviewing a contract and I see both in there, I will push back and try to get some clarity because they are different. Well, I have, uh, we're nearing the end, we're getting to lunch. I wanted to remind you all you have your critique sheets there. Please fill them out. Let us know, especially uh, for those on the phone, please fill out your survey. survey. I want to know if this format's good. I know three hours is a bit long for a webinar, so for those of you who are still on the line, I appreciate you hanging in there. Um, I want to thank Jennifer for speaking today. I want to thank Anna for being at our computer and advancing our slides, and I especially want to thank Donna. Um, she helps us put this on every year. When you see her at the front, please thank her. She's put together the books, all the giveaways, um, and everything, so please make sure to thank her as you walk out. Uh, also, please make sure to take handouts. And then for the Foley attorneys in the room, can you stand up so I make sure I don't miss anyone? Uh, we have Jeff Kopp over there, a labor and employment attorney in Detroit. We have Kim O'Brien, government contracts attorney in Detroit. We have Miha Zomer, who is a government contracts attorney in our DC office. We have Steve Hilfinger, business law partner in our Detroit office. Obviously, we met Jennifer. And Anna Ross, uh, government contracts and compliance attorney, I'd say. She also does healthcare work out of our DC office. So please network with everyone as you walk around. And uh, please stay for lunch. I look forward to talking to as many people as possible, and thank you for coming.